All right, we're going to get started this morning, but we're going to change it up a little bit uh, just for this Sunday, maybe next Sunday as well. But typically we do this, and um, you, you hear, you and I hear so much from the world uh, in its way to basically hijack what Christianity is, and I know you know that, but it is a reality that the joy that we find in the Savior, the world who does not know Christ as its Savior, finds itself reaching out, trying to find joy in some other celebration, some other means or ways of celebrating. And they, in turn, call their counterfeit for Christ their joy. I was watching the Alabama ball game last night, playing the Gators of Florida, and the announcer was saying that they just wanted to Wish everybody a, a really happy, uh, a really wonderful holiday season, and, and um, that uh, you know that we know that the, the greatest gift of this time of year. And I've said, oh, here it comes, here it comes. It's, it's, he's going to say it is Jesus Christ, but he didn't. He says the greatest gift that any of us have this time of year is our family. And it is a great gift, but it is not a substitute for God Almighty. And Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And through God's influence in our lives, through the person of Jesus Christ as our Savior, we learn to have more compassion. We do learn to have more truthfulness to our lives. We learn to be more forgiving. We learn to be more understanding. And we learn to be more convicted to our Creator than anything else. Uh, because it is Him to whom we shall return. As I said with someone I was speaking with last night, uh, the greatest difference between us and God is that He doesn't die. We do. And He doesn't report to us. We are going to report to Him. Other than the birth of Christ and the death of Christ, that was the short little period of time called 33 years in which our Lord lived upon this earth that He gave His life for us on the cross of Calvary and shed his blood there that we could have eternal life if we would but receive him as our Savior. And uh, But anyway, I want to talk about something this morning. You see it in your bulletins. Uh, Mary found favor with God. I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Mary found favor with God. This is topical lesson 740. December the 20th, 2020. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18 is where I pick up because beginning with verse 1 of Matthew, uh, we see a genealogy uh, of Jesus Christ through Solomon and his foster and through his foster father, Joseph. Now Luke gives the genealogy of Mary. And Matthew gives the genealogy of our Savior's foster father. And that Jesus was virgin born. Joseph was not the biological father. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary through the Immaculate Conception of the Holy Spirit. We know that, but that's significant. I want to talk about this this morning, but I want to talk a little bit about the fact that Mary found favor with God. Matthew 1, verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was in this way, or on this wise. Okay, here we go. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a righteous or just man, not willing to make her a public example, minded to put her away privately or by divorce. But while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord. You may have in your text the angel of the Lord, but the definite article is not here because when the definite article, the word the, identifies a specific angel, this angel would have been Jesus himself because he was the angel of the Lord as mentioned in the Old Testament many times. Though he's a messenger, that's what an angel means, but this was an angel of the Lord that appeared unto uh, Joseph, in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, 
Now, he was the direct son of David. He was a descendant of King David. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Exactly what that's what the word means. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, this is Isaiah, the prophet, 800 years earlier. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Or the God with us. Definite article, the is seen before the word theos in the Greek. The God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not. Didn't have uh, marriage consensual uh, relations with her. Till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Father, we ask you to help us understand this precious passage of Scripture. Understanding, if we can, what the emotions and the mindset that Mary and Joseph had uh, in this time in their life. And we ask you to help us to kind of step into their shoes, as it were, or sandals, and see life as they saw it and how they had faith in uh, the message from you that came through the angel and had faith that you cared all the care you could for them in the world, and that you had a divine plan that was not going to fail. And Father, we pray that as we look into your word ourselves, that we will realize that your plan for us is also a plan that will not fail. And so thank you for this day, and thank you for the blessing that we have to gather. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I think it's amazing how God makes things so simple and so concise. When God does a marvelous thing, he demonstrates his power and in doing so demonstrates his great love. And often we fail to realize that the power of God is demonstrated through his miracles. When the news of a pregnancy is announced, the happy couple make room in their hearts for a new life. Then they make room also for the adjustments that that's going to bring to their life as well. And regardless of the heartaches that will come, of course, as being parents, of the long nights of feeding and changing and caring for the child, and bringing home the provisions to take care of the child, you begin to imagine your life with that new family member well before its arrival. Smiles overcome worry, and faith overcomes your fears. But you find now that your prayers are longer. You find now that they are heavier in content, that a new one is on the way in your life. And so you start to prepare a place in your heart and in your home for this new arrival. I think that's the way it's supposed to be. I think that's the way that we see the joy of God being shared with us through the miracle of how He ordained that we should propagate the world, but not only that, but also prosper our hearts and our homes. Children need to be seen in that regard. But in Matthew 1, 18 through 25, as I just read, for Mary, especially the mother of Jesus, her story is a bit different than the rest of all other mothers, and for several reasons. Number one, she was a virgin. And when the news was given to her, she said, how can this be? I've yet to know a man that is in the physical way and of intercourse. And at the time, she was espoused to Joseph. A man whom she had never known in the marital way. Okay, you get what I'm saying. And though we find out, another unusual thing about the pregnancy of Mary is that her child is conceived 
by power of the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. That God's divine plan was to put within her womb and within that egg the seed of God. Not physically, but to do it as a miracle. And then the child was conceived. The immaculate conception. A sinless seed. God made the world. God made men. God made women. God made the reproductive system. Without going into great detail, we understand that God made our systems the way they are. And they're very complicated and they can get all messed up. We understand that as well. But we understand how that conception takes place. But another thing is that Mary's child is also prophesied to be the savior of the world. Now, that's one thing if a grandma or granddad or even you or your, your husband say, look, this, this child, oh, he, she's going to do great things. He's going to do great things. We have great promise for her or him. You know, they're going to be the president of a company or they're going to be a great uh, singer or they're going to be an explorer or whatever, or a great teacher or they're going to be so good in, in being somebody who's a real good help to the neighborhood and so things. And then, but when you're a person, you're a woman and you're a young teenager like Mary was, you're, you've got this heavy burden laid on you that, uh, well, I just want you to know that this child that you're going to bear is going to save the entire world from its sins. And without him, it's not going to happen. But another thing would come upon Mary is that she would have to tell Joseph of her pregnancy. And that would come to him as a shock. Before Mary, verse 18, was espoused to Joseph, when Mary was espoused to Joseph, we'll get into that in a minute, before they came together, marital cohabitation, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a righteous or just man, not willing to make a public example, was minded to put to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly or privately. Because Mary had to tell him, Joseph, I've got some news. You might want to sit down for this one. <laughs> I'm pregnant and it's not yours. Can you imagine the shock on that poor old guy's face? And he, some believe that he was not much older than her. Some say he's a real old man. I don't believe it. I believe they were an age-wise compatible. A couple of years difference maybe. What Mary would tell Joseph of her pregnancy would come as a shock to him as a just man, as this verse uh, 19 says. And he at first, I believe, felt betrayed and shamed by the news from Mary. Also, he looked at the legal ramifications that, you know, this was going to be looked harshly down upon by the scribes and Pharisees. And the whole family was going to be disgraced and be in trouble, be on the outs with people from now on. And so he felt that the only just and and more importantly merciful thing to do was to break off the espousal, just break off that relationship. Not drag her through the courts and all this other stuff. Not go out into the public square and say, shame, shame on you, young lady, and all that stuff. There's no way this could be possible. Imagine a man being engaged to some young lady and, you know, weeks, two or so weeks before they're to... They're making their marriage plans and they're getting the church or whatever set up and everything is being arranged, the flowers are being ordered, the, the invitations have already been sent out to the wedding, uh, the family is already footing the bill for the caterers and all that, and all of a sudden, uh, the one of the two in this day and age, one of the two tells the other, I'm sorry, but in the last few weeks I've been unfaithful to you. And I don't know what to do. And the other one says, well, we just, we're not going to marry You've been unfaithful to me. I'm not going to marry you now. What's going to happen after we get married? You think that's going to stop? But this is not the case with her. She was always faithful. 
But it was a time when the Son of God would be born to the world and there had to be one to whom this immaculate conception would happen to. She was highly favored of the Lord. But to Joseph's point of view, the only merciful thing to do, the only just thing, was to break off this espousal, which was legally in those days seen as being married without the physical uh, connection that came with the the formal celebration with the family. And so when it's, today we would say engaged, back then when you got engaged, you were married, legally bound one to the other person. That's the difference in our custom and in their custom, that when you made the commitment to be engaged to someone or a spouse to someone, you were theirs. That's never going to change. And there were dowries that were exchanged between the families. And if anyone broke the vow, the dowry of the other family, plus anything that they would have ever inherited, would have go to the innocent party. So if you were inherit your father's farm or his business, and you were the heir because you had by law a legal right to that heir, you would not get it, even if you were the daughter. In Mary's case, it would have all gone to Joseph and his heirs and his family. Every bit of it. And vice versa. If Joseph had been found to be unfaithful to Mary in this case, which was not the case in the scripture, but if Joseph had been unfaithful to Mary, everything that he had laid out as a dowry and then anything that was his to be as an heir in his family from his father would automatically go to Mary and her family. Then... Not at death, but then. So Mary's family stood to lose everything they had because of this alleged unfaithfulness that Joseph maybe thought that it was on her side. Obviously, she's the one that's pregnant. Somebody's got to be responsible for this. You expect me to believe that you're pregnant and you haven't been unfaithful to me? And so he had to swallow hard and he thought, I just need to break off the espousal, which meant he was going to uh, give, he was going to surrender. He was going to surrender his right to her, her possessions. He wasn't going to take her for all that she and her family were worth. He was going to say, I don't, I'm not going to do that to you. Secretly. We're just going to make an agreement that we're going to go our separate ways and I'm not going to take the dowry. I'm not going to take your heirship, whatever you might inherit down the road. I'm not going to take what was left for and I'm not going to shame you out publicly. I'm just going to tell you that uh, it just didn't work out and then that will be the message that everybody will get that it just didn't work out. Of course, you're still going to have a baby. (laughs) Everybody will eventually figure it out. Something happened. Joseph's love, though, for God, as we will see, had to be greater even than his love for Mary. Now, I want to give you the name of a book that is a really good book to read on what life was like back in the day. I didn't bring it with me. It's in my study at the house. I've got two studies, of course. And it's a book written by Alfred Erdersheim. Alfred Erdersheim is called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. And it gives you in detail the historical life and customs and also the documentation of where these historical uh, accounts can be found in certain writings. And it's a wonderful book to have. I had to study it as a... I don't know what grade I was in in college. Junior maybe, but I did a outline of the book, studied every bit of it in detail, and had to write a summary of the book. It's about like this. It's a wonderful book. And it was written by a pastor of a small country church. Didn't have a large congregation. And this is what he spent his life doing was writing. Because he didn't have peop- a big, big crowd to preach to, but man, could he write. I don't know how well he preached, but he knew his stuff. I'd like to have been in his church. I'm thankful for the pastor that I had 
But if I'd have had one, Albert Erdershine would have been one whale of a pastor to have had. Small setting would have suited me just fine. But Alfred Erdersheim's book, Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, really gives a lot more than what I'm going to have to give you today about what the marriage customs were in that day. And what and he didn't live in that day, but he studied all the works of Josephus and Eusebius and others and all the documents that dealt with those early years and what life was for the Jew with regard to the Roman citizens that are around him as well and li- ruling over them. But by tradition, only after he would be ready to take her to his home to live would he come to take her as his wife. And so once the spousal, the legal agreement was made between the man and the woman and their families, because it was a family thing, then it was his responsibility to make sure that he had secured adequate employment and adequate housing, whatever that might be, so that he could take care of the other man and woman's daughter and assure them that she would be well cared for. She may not live high on the hog, but she would not be a pauper either. Okay. And to show the betrothal of my love for her, today we give an engagement ring. Back then they'd give a goat, or they'd give a piece of jewelry, or they'd give something, but it would be held in dowry in a holding. Okay. To save her from public disgrace as an apparent adulteress also, wherein she may have been stoned to death as per the Old Testament commandment seen in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 23 through 34, she could have been stoned to death. Is the assumption that she is having an illegitimate child, perhaps. I don't know. But that's not the child's fault. In this case, it was God's plan. So he was going to secretly divorce her, and that was allowed to be done under Jewish law. Included in this divorce, though, he had the option that all that she would ever have would be his by default. He had the option of taking that. Even what she may have later gained as an heir to what her family left her. Now that's found in Vincent's word studies as well on this passage of Scripture. Vincent's word studies. However, God sent an angel to Joseph to reveal in a dream the divine plan. Do not divorce her, but go ahead and marry her right then before it ever got out to the village. So apparently Mary let him know quite soon uh, that she was pregnant. She didn't wait till she was trying to hide it and everything. She let him know very soon. She must have been an honest person because no one else yet knew, so she wasn't showing So, okay, let's go ahead and divorce her. She's not showing to be pregnant. And apparently she let him know quite early as soon as she found out that this was happened to her. That's scary. It's got to be scary. As far as her age goes, some believe she was as young as 14. Some say as old as 18. So I'll shoot for 16. I don't know how old she was, but it's believed, and as, as custom was then, girls were being married by the time they were 14 years old back in the day. It's a different world then. It's like family was everything. And girls started feeling like if I'm not married and have a family, I don't have anything. Family was everything. And everything that that mother did was for that family. And they cherished everything. They didn't have things. They didn't have a lot of stuff. They didn't have entertainment like we do. They had their forms of entertainment, but life was very simple. It was very straight. It was very clear-cut, and it was very survivalistic as, as, it, as survival goes. That wasn't uncommon in the early Americas as either, as far as that goes. People make fun of that a lot of times, but that was just more of a common thing than you probably imagine. Well... God sent an angel to reveal in a dream the divine plan to not divorce Mary, but to marry her. And says in verse 20, But while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, 
For that is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Joseph would require a great deal of faith in God's word, and he would require a great deal of faith in Mary's innocence. Those two things that would require faith, that Joseph had faith in the Almighty and he had faith in humanity, mainly and specifically, namely, Mary. And there are times when we all have to have faith in God, but there are also times you've got to have faith in people. And Joseph had to have faith in her because, you know, this was all, you know, out of this world. He had to have faith in Mary's innocence that this child, and she told him what the angel told her, that she was going to conceive of this child and who it would be. And the angel told Joseph, yeah, this child is going to come into this world and it's from God. It's not something bad that she did. So Mary's innocence was was tried. God's word was tried, but Joseph's faith was even more tried. That the child was from God and he would have his faith tried as to, to the veracity of the angel's message in that dream. And so Mary would also need faith that God would convince Joseph that she had done nothing wrong. So Mary had to have faith in God's message from that angel that this was from the Lord and who this baby was going to be and what this baby was to represent and do for mankind. And she was also going to have faith that God was going to speak to her spouse, her husband, as it were, to square it away with him, which God did. And I sometimes pray for God to speak to my wife. To, to help, to help her to understand what I'm dealing with as a pastor, as a, as a husband, as a man. And I believe that she prays for God to reveal to me what I need to do to be a better husband to her. Don't ever think that the thing that you're praying for the other person to do on your part, they're praying for you to do on their part, God doing that part for, through you too. But God helped Joseph by coming to his aid as he struggled with his faith. It was revealed, of course, as you see, that Joseph, that indeed the baby Mary carried was conceived of the Holy Spirit. It appears that Joseph was a man of pious faith and a man who put trust in God and the Word of God. So that pretty much settled it for Joseph. The Old Testament prophecies foretold of a child who will be born to a virgin. Why not her? Or why her? Well, why hers? Because Mary found favor in the eyes of God. This child would be Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 tells us that. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel or Emmanuel. I-M-M-A-N-U-E-L. And that is literally meaning God with us. Also, Matthew 1.23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted, God with us. Also, Micah, the prophet, towards the end of the Old Testament, had a prophecy. And if Joseph read and studied not only the prophecy of uh, Isaiah, but also the prophecy of Micah. Micah's prophecy told Joseph and any well-versed Israelite that this child would be born in the little village of Bethlehem. Now, this was yet to come. And we'll get there in the next lesson. They were in Nazareth. That's up north near the city of present-day Haifa. And they would travel south down to Bethlehem, which is five miles on the other side of Jerusalem. Just a little... Hamlet, basically, nothing big fancy. Didn't even rank being on a map back in the day. It is now, but not then. And so in the prophet Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2, Joseph would have read that there would one day come forth a ruler in Israel whose goings forth had been from old, from everlasting, that this would be a divine sent redeemer. Well, it would have to come through someone, and it would have to come through the uh, the lineage of David. He knew that prophecy. It would have to come uh, in, 
to a virgin, and Mary says, well, that's me. And I'm the one. You know, sometimes it's so hard for people to believe that you're actually the one. I'll tell you, I'll give you a perfect example of this. I'm being a little humorous right now, but I used to watch wrestling all the time as a child growing up. My daddy would have us work on Saturdays on the farm. Of course, we worked during the week too. But on Saturdays, we made sure we got in on time to watch Mid-Atlantic Wrestling. Usually it's from Starland Arena, right here in the great town of Roanoke, Virginia. And then there were other places they had the wrestling as well. It was probably at the old National Guard Armory uh, on Reserve Avenue. And there was places all around where they would wrestle. And they had all kinds of names and everything. But we always made sure that we stopped long enough to cutting wood or whatever we were doing on the farm to watch wrestling. It came on every Saturday around noon, lasted till 1230, maybe 1 o'clock, but it was it was wild and exciting. And we could not get wait to get out the front or back door, my brother and I, to try one of those moves out. Every once in a while we'd try one of those moves out on my father. It didn't work out too well for us, but at least we tried. And there was a wrestler by the name of Chief Wahoo McDaniel. Stout man. Well, I met him at Dorton Arena uh, when I was in uh, the Army at Fort Bragg. A buddy of mine by the name of Gary Knapp from Brattleboro, Vermont. We went up there with another friend of ours to take in some wrestling, as they called it. And we were sitting out there, and he was fighting a fellow by the name of uh, Johnny Valentine. He was mean as a snake. So he made the bad guy look bad, and Chief Wahoo made the good lies look good. So I... Saw him stand over there, and people were getting autographs, so I walked over to him, and I got a chance to talk with him for a while. Man had great big, his hands looked like looked like a, a, a ham. You've seen a big old ham with that, he great big old thick hand, great, just real nice guy. And I thought to myself, when I walked over and started talking to him, shook his hand, he had his outfit and all on, I thought, this is happening. This is really Chief Wahoo McDaniel. He is all that in a bag of chips and can of corn to go with it. He was always the one I'd cheer for. Well, anyhow, that happened. That was real. I know that sounds a little silly, but when you finally realize that this person is the real person, then you accept them for who they are, professional wrestler or professional ball player or professional musician or actress or actor. I guess they call them all actors now. You don't want to separate anybody from thinking there, there's actually a gender that's wearing that dress. We don't even know that anymore. But I call them actors and actresses. And I've met very few of those. It's interesting when you meet people. I met Senator John Warner years ago. He's was Elizabeth Taylor's husband, and he was a senator here in Virginia. That's not Mark Warner, but John Warner. That's preceded him. I thought, that's the guy. And we shook hands on a stage in Salem, Virginia. But now here we have Jesus Christ. And this is all coming into Joseph's thinking as he's told this by this angel. And all the doctrine of this of the prophecy of the first coming of Jesus Christ is now rolling through his head, and this is starting to check off all the boxes. Yeah, this is right. This is right. <laughs> when you get to heaven to be with the Lord one of these days, whether in death or the rapture, you're, the first one I believe is going to meet you is the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior. And you're going to say, this is real. This is happening. I'm no longer sick. I'm no longer suffering. I'm in the presence of the Lord Jesus right now, and I'm in heaven. I don't deserve to be here, and we'll drop to our knees and just thank Him so much for saving us from our sins. We can't, we shouldn't be able to stop doing that now. But I think for Jesus, He's not real enough to even His own people. And I, I don't want to just use imagination. Doctrine, Bible doctrine, the Word of God is what we is that, is that channel that we have. He's real. And Micah 5, 2 says that's who this is going to be. This child would come from a, for a specific purpose, with a specific purpose, to save the people from their sins. Joseph didn't argue with the angel of the Lord. He even was even told what to name the baby. 
In verse 24, then Joseph being raised from sleep, this dream that he was had, this information that was being revealed to him, uh, he was raised from his sleep. He did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife. And the word, and took unto him his wife, means they had the formal ceremony. And knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. He called his name Jesus. Luke one thirty one. also Mary was to call the baby Jesus. That was the instruction of the angel of the Lord here. So talk about God laying a heavy life change and revelation on someone. Mary, for sure. And also Joseph. Both have, most have been, must have been reeling for days. A lesson we can learn here is that testing comes to all of us sometime or another. So now is the time to prepare. And I believe their life before this all transpired was a life that was building up for God to reveal to them something very special and wonderful that was not going to be a part of anyone else's life in this way, in this manner. And so God, is, I believe, is always, through His Word, uh, trying to prepare us if we'll receive the Word, and hopefully on a regular basis, because uh, we're going to need that Word to encourage us to stay true when that testing, and it's a prosperity test for sure. But Mary must have been an awfully remarkable young lady, Perhaps in her mid-teens, maybe late teens, but I imagine more mid-teens, when Jesus was conceived and born. She was highly favored of God, meaning much grace was upon her life. And apparently her spiritual capacity was tremendous. Though she, like Joseph, was of the lineage of King David, and I'll ask that for homework, if you want, you might read Luke one twenty-seven. And Romans 1 and verse 13 uh, to kind of clarify in your mind. And I'm going to read Romans chapter 1 and verse 3, excuse me, Romans 1 and verse 3 regarding uh, the genealogy of Mary. Because so often people question the genealogy uh, through Mary. But it's very apparent that the genealogy through the, uh, through the, that Matthew gives of uh, Joseph is very clear that he was of the lineage of David. And some people say, well, Mary's was not quite as clear. And actually, it had to be even more clear than Joseph's because it was of the blood of the Jewish people and of the lineage of the tribe of Judah. Jesus could not have been born as the lion of the tribe of Judah and have come through any one other, and which David was in that lineage as well. But in... Romans 1 and verse 3, I find it interesting. Just have a little perspicacity here. Paul says regarding being saved, which God had promised before by His prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning His Son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Joseph's flesh had nothing to do with the conception of Jesus. It was Mary's flesh that held the cards, as it were, to the lineage of Jesus being born of the seed of David, not Joseph, because they didn't have sex. It wasn't his child, but he would foster that child as his own, as he was instructed by the angel of the Lord. But Mary would be of the flesh, which meant she was he was fully of the tribe of Judah, of the seed of David. I want to also note here that neither are mentioned to have come from a wealthy, connected family. Both appear, however, to have come from stable, if not godly families. That is the kind of wealth no money can buy. Money influence do not buy virtue or class as you can instill into your children. And I also want to note, too, regarding the lineage of Mary. In Luke 3, 23 through 38... It gives a lineage that is for Mary, not for Joseph. His is already given in Matthew 1, 1 through 17. But as as of custom, the lineage always was connected to the man's name, not the mother's name. That was custom. That's just the way it was. And so that didn't miss a beat either when it came to it. You know, when my son has two sons, 
I'm proud of all of them. I'm proud of all my children, but it is my grandsons who will carry on the Reynolds seed. Because the woman doesn't carry on the seed. She carries the seed of the man, but she doesn't produce the seed. The man produces the seed. And for the name of the family. And for that lineage of that family, the man does. It's been that way since Adam and Eve. And for the name of a family, it can die when there's no more of that family seed. Doesn't mean that they're not loved. Doesn't mean that you don't have daughters and kin. But the seed of the name of the seed dies. That's just the way it is. And so I hope my grandsons, one of them has a little boy one of these days. If my granddaughters do, that will be fine. But it won't be a Reynolds. It won't be my seed. Better not be. <laughs> Our children are not inbreeding. <laughs> there are those in nature and society who have actually done that just to keep the name of the family in the family. What a bunch of crazies to do that. But in the beginning, it kind of started out that way, it seems like. But that not normal now. Another question as we close is why the virgin birth, and you all know that, but simply put, for those who may not, the child could not be born of the seed of the man, for in the seed of the man is the sin nature passed on from generation to generation. Romans 5, 12 and verse 18. Romans 5 and verse 12. For those that might not understand this, I feel like it's incumbent to read it. But Romans 5 and verse 12 says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all mankind for all is sin. And it's through the man, not through the woman. And verse 18 says, Therefore is by the offense of one judgment came upon all. That's by the offense of Adam. Because God held Adam accountable, not Eve. She was deceived, but he did it knowingly. Therefore, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, that is Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So condemnation came through Adam. Justification comes through Jesus Christ. And thus is prophesied as part of the curse that God put on creation since the fall of mankind, that it would be the seed coming forth from the woman that would crush the seed of the serpent. The serpent is Satan, the evil one who tempted Eve, Genesis 3 and verse 15. But with Mary pure and wholesome, though not with a sin nature, God chose to implant the divine seed by way of the Holy Spirit called the Immaculate Conception, bringing forth both God and humanity within the womb of the Virgin Mary, the sinless baby Jesus. Even her cousin Elizabeth, as per Luke 1.36 Though it was past childbearing age, she too would find herself with child by her husband Zacharias. Then follow up the words of the angel Gabriel, Luke one thirty seven. For with God nothing shall be impossible. So Elizabeth would bear John the Baptist a few months earlier. He would be the last Old Testament prophet. And Mary would bear Jesus, the Savior of the world, a few months later. So indeed, Mary found great favor in the eyes of God as she was deemed blessed for all generations. And so if you would take a moment, maybe this week, to read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 46 through 56, that wonderful prayer of Mary. So God bless you all as you read that and add to your edification of the wonderful history that is behind our Christian faith. Father, thank you for this day and for your blessings. Thank you for your word, and we ask for your guidance and strength. And in the process of this day, may we continue until we be reminded of who our Savior Jesus Christ is. In his name we pray and give thanks. Amen.